This is Into Healing, and I'm your host, Mira Adura. Today's Into Healing guest is Michael Dadashi. Michael is a visionary entrepreneur and huge advocate for addiction recovery. His decade-long struggle with addiction followed by his path to recovery inspired him to want to extend work opportunities, which were in effect life-saving opportunities to others battling addiction. Hearing Michael's healing journey highlighted not only the complexities of addiction and its profound impact on people, but also how healing from the depths of despair is not only possible, but makes way for a joyous and fulfilling life. If you enjoyed this episode, please like, subscribe, and follow us for more transformational healing stories. Hi, Michael. How are you? I'm good. Great. It's so great to have you here. Thank you so much. Michael, you are a owner of three different businesses, a yes. founder of two of them. Yes. Um, your life um, feels very expansive. It is, yes. But it definitely was not always like that. No, it was expansive in a different way, <laughs> <laughs> in a chaotic way. Yes. Um, so you grew up without a lot of money in Austin, Texas. Yes. Yeah. Very, um, very, uh, probably low middle class. Yeah. Yeah. And you have a fairly unique cultural background as well. Yes. Can you tell us a little bit about your childhood and how you saw yourself in the world? Yeah. So... Um, I was born in Austin, Texas, and that's where I currently live. You know, I ended up making my way back to Austin. Um, so my parents divorced when I was three years old. My dad uh, moved here from Iran in the early 70s, met my mom, and they got married during the revolution. Mm. So their marriage actually, you know, protected my dad from getting deported mm -hmm. back to Iran because at that time they were deporting yeah. or going through a process of, of trying to send people back to Iran during 79. So my parents got married and that gave my dad citizenship. You know, it was like a serendipitous timing for him and for my mom. And then I was born in Austin in 83 and they just had a tumultuous marriage, you know. Mm -hmm. That's what they shared with me. Obviously, mm -hmm. I didn't know the details, but they separated when I was three years old. And then I moved to Las Vegas and my dad moved to California mm -hmm. from Austin. You know, my parents split up and went their separate ways. And through my childhood, I lived with my mom and was raised with my mom. And I would see my dad, you know, for summer breaks or spring breaks. Mm -hmm. But my mom just really struggled to, you know, find a career that mm -hmm. she, you know, could fall in love with. And she was a waitress, you know, mm -hmm. uh, my whole childhood growing up, you know, mm -hmm. just getting different jobs at... Olive Garden or, you know, different Italian restaurants. She has an Italian background, so mm -hmm. she would always migrate to being a server mm -hmm. at different Italian restaurants. And um, and we would move around trying for her to try to find her identity and like career and roots being a single mom and raising me by herself. So we just really bounced around from, you know, Las Vegas to Florida back to California, mm. uh, and then finally ended up back in Texas when I was in sixth grade. And through that process of growing up and, you know, going to, you know, a dozen different elementary schools, um, I had to be a chameleon. I had to really, you know, um, kind of adapt to the new culture that I was in. You know, Las Vegas had a different culture with mm -hmm. kids than Florida did. And, you know, I would be in lower lower middle class kind of poor neighborhoods growing up. And it was a very diverse, you know, area growing up. So there was, you know, a lot of people of color or a lot of, you know, people of different, uh, you know, nationalities and backgrounds. And I just had to really adapt and, you know, and, and, and mold myself into fitting in. That's, mm -hmm. or that's what I thought mm -hmm. when I was, you know, a uh, uh, elementary school kid. It's like, hey, how can I fit in and like kind of adapt myself to this new group of friends and cliques and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So that kind of molded me when I was a child to be a chameleon and really, you know, be malleable with every environment that I was in. Mm -hmm. How did that feel emotionally to ch to have so much change as a kid? It was it was the I mean the one word that I could describe 
um, emotionally was fear. Mm. You know, it caused a lot of fear. Mm. And even though I didn't know that word or really pinpoint that word when I was a kid, looking back, I could see that fear drove all of my emotions. Yeah. You know, that was like the root of all of my emotions was fear um, because I wanted to fit in. Yeah, you know, as a kid, I wanted to not get bullied at school or I wanted people not to make fun of me or, mm -hmm. you know, make fun of my name or make fun of my background or just play with me, you know, play soccer, or play football with me on the on the playground or during recess. So, you know, fear was the main emotion and it caused me just not to feel comfortable in my own skin. Yeah. When you were still a child, mm -hmm. there was things that started to go off the rails. Yes. Right? So can you tell us how you got into addiction? Like what started to get off the rails and how you made your way into addiction? Yeah, so basically it was really just boils down to me not feeling comfortable in my own skin and not having a connection with my authentic self. You know, I describe it as like this screw that is tightening inside of me throughout my childhood. And as I went through middle school, you know, I could do things and become obsessed with things that would temporarily fill the void. So I became very obsessed with skateboarding and skateboard culture and having that group of friends that was like, an obsession of mine and like 24 seven, if I wasn't at school, I was skateboarding and like involved in that culture. And that temporarily filled the void and gave me a sense of belonging. security. Yeah, belonging and security. And then, you know, doing, you know, excelling in school and getting praise for, you know, you know, being the number one student in math or, you know, um, you know, really excelling in this pre SAT test that they gave us in middle school and getting accepted for this program, you know, that praise from the teachers or from my mom and dad would give me a temporary sense of relief or, you know, you know, euphoria. I yeah. can't really describe it in any other way. So really those were all temporary fixes and the screw was still tightening inside of me, you know, every day. I just didn't feel comfortable in my own skin. And then finally, in ninth grade, my freshman year of high school, I was introduced to alcohol. And I was always very against alcohol and drugs because I had seen people in my family over drink or, you know, have problems with substances. And it was just not attractive to me at all. And, and I was really scared of it, to be honest with you. But because of peer pressure and because I didn't have a good sense of self and, you know, belief in my own self, I felt like I had to be a part of that clique, of that skateboard culture. Mm -hmm. So I took the drink because I wanted to be a part of the, the guys, you know, that were doing this, you know, on the weekend. Yeah. And I remember vividly the first time I drank alcohol, like I drank the first drink. You were what, 13 at that point? Um, I was 15. 15. I think 14 or 15, ninth grade. It was, it was ninth grade and I, I think I was around 14 or 15. And then I took that first drink and I didn't feel anything. And my friend's like, have a second one, you'll feel it by the second one. And I remember the, the, when I finished that second beer or malt liquor, I don't remember what it was. I remember this overwhelming sense of peace and belonging. It was a spiritual awakening for me. Like my shoulders dropped and I remember going into the restroom and looking in the mirror and feeling like I had arrived. I, I remember it vividly. I was like, oh my God, this is the solution mm -hmm. to all of them. I didn't think that at the moment, but I could feel it. Yeah. That was the feeling like just a sense of extreme belonging. I felt so connected mm -hmm. to my friends. I felt like that was the missing glue that I needed to be connected to people and to feel, I felt immediately comfortable in my own skin yeah. once that second beer kicked in. And then I just, from day one, started chasing that feeling. And I had the third drink and the fourth drink and the fifth drink. And I blacked out the very first time oh. I drank. And, you know, wake, I woke up like feeling completely miserable. And I remember like bits and pieces of that night of just like throwing up and oh. like, you know, falling around. And, and I woke up feeling horrible and having flashbacks of just throwing up uncontrollably. 
but I couldn't wait to do it again. Oh. Like my sense of my, my feeling of pain oh. was outweighed by the good feeling that I got from it. I, I only remember, I was like, I remember the feeling of looking in the mirror and feeling that sense of belonging and that sense of finally finding peace in myself. And I was like, oh my God, I can't wait to drink again. And like I told my friends, I'm like, let's do it again tonight. Mm -hmm. And they were like, they were like, oh, we feel so, because they were felt sick too. You know, we're all young and didn't have a tolerance. They're like, no way, man, I feel so sick. We can't do that again. And I was the complete opposite, like ready to do it again. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Huh. And that was, I mean, that was when, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I became an alcoholic on my first drink. Or I was an alcoholic and had alcoholism. Because with alcoholism, alcohol is not the problem. The ism is the problem. Mm -hmm. I was an, I had alcohol ism before I even took a drink or experienced alcohol. And it's really that feeling of, you know, ir yes, uh, restless, irritable, and discontent. Mm. I felt restless, irritable, and discontent, which is the ism of alcoholism, huh. before I ever took the drink. Wow. So the drink was my solution to that restless, irritable discontent. Wow. Yeah. It's amazing how much awareness now you have about Oh my this. God, like I could, piece back the moment by moment like a surgeon and find the root of my problem. Like I, looking back, I knew exactly the pattern that I was already forming. So what was your experience of addiction like? Well, at the first, you know, few years, like I said, it was my solution. I felt like I had arrived. You know, I felt like I finally found the missing puzzle piece of my life. Yeah, I magic can't, potion. Yeah, it was my magic potion. I was like, as long as I have alcohol, and then I found marijuana, and then I found uh, prescription pills like Valium and Xanax and Klonopin, um, I and I would take like, you know, just as much as I could of all three of those, and that was my solution. I felt like as long as I had that, when I was in a group setting, I'm fabulous. Mm -hmm. I'm great. Like I can do whatever. I can finally feel comfortable in my own skin. I can connect with my friends. I can, you know, talk to people authentically. It really brought out my authentic self that I had been uh, bottled up my whole life. Wow. It's, it's interesting. It makes me think how much addiction is rooted in just wanting to find safety in our yes. bodies. Yes. And find basically a sense of identity and peace. Mm. Yeah. Hmm. Um, when did you hit rock bottom? So, like I said, the first couple years were great. You know, even though I would have, you know, different nights where I would black out or get hungover, I didn't have any consequences, really, during those first couple years. Like, I would black out and wake up the next morning and feel sick, and then, you know, you're young, so I'd recover so fast, and I had zero consequences. But then... During, I think it was my junior year of high school, I found opiates and opioids. And it started with Oxycontin. I remember that I was just like obsessed with substances. So any substance that would change the way I felt, I wanted to try. And I remember vividly reading a Time Magazine article that had Oxycontin on the, on the cover page. And it was like the newest, you know, uh, pill it was called like hillbilly heroin or something and I remember reading that and I would never in a million years think of trying heroin like heroin or cocaine or crack those were off the table they were for like what I considered in my mind for like homeless people bad people drug addicts that's what I thought those drugs were but pills or alcohol or marijuana were for normal people. That's what I thought in my, oh. you know, high school, you know, mind frame. So I remember seeing this Time Magazine article about this m magical pill, and I just started seeking it out. And really, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. I was practicing like law of attraction and manifestation back when I was in middle school because I was obsessed with finding this pill. I was like, I want to find this pill. I want to try it. Oh my 
That's where my mind went from reading this Time magazine article. Oh my God. Yeah, it was so Probably crazy. Probably the opposite of what they really wanted the audience yeah, to do. Yeah, they wanted the audience to know how dangerous it was, and it did the exact opposite with wow. me. Same thing with uh, MDMA, ecstasy. I read an article and I was like, oh my God, I got to find ecstasy wow. and try this. You know, it was very big back in the late 90s. So I, 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 I attracted it into my life. Like what you think about and are obsessed with, mm. you will attract okay. into your life. And I learned that, you know, after my sobriety, that it really is a law of the universe and it really does work. So I, one of my friends one day goes, hey, my mom has this pill. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm looking. I've been oh looking for this. Yeah. And it was like I hit the lottery. I was like, get me, you know, get me one. I want to try it. And again, that was my second spiritual awakening. When I tried that Oxycontin for the first time, I felt like I had finally arrived again, like a new arrival. Like it was better than alcohol. It was better than marijuana. It like truly filled the void completely in my life. Mm. And that then trumped everything else. I didn't even care about drinking or like smoking weed. I just wanted to get Oxycontin and I became like immediately addicted to it. And I didn't realize that opioids and opiates were physically addicting. Like I didn't know, I'm just, I'm just a 16, 17 year old. Like I have no knowledge of the ramifications of taking these drugs. So I started taking it and just whenever I could, I would, you know, buy some and I attracted it into my life. People knew that I wanted it. And anytime people had prescription opiates, they would sell them to me and I would, wow. you know, start selling them. And I, and I started selling weed to get extra money to, you know, just have my own money to buy pills. And really, that's when my rock bottom started was when I went through withdrawal and I and I finally, you know, didn't have pills one day. And I went through this like physical withdrawal that I had no idea what I was dealing with. And I was like, why do I feel sick? I felt like I had the flu and it just wouldn't go away. And then I finally got a, a an oxy. And I took the oxy and immediately my flu went away. And that's when it clicked for me, like, oh, the oxy is causing wow. the sickness. And then that scared the, the crap out of me. I was like, oh my God, this, if I don't have this pill now, I'm gonna go, I'm gonna feel sick and feel like I have a flu and like wanna just curl up in a ball wow. and not be able to move. So that's when I started really hitting rock bottom. Is there a point in that rock bottom phase where you were really, you did not feel that there was a way out? Yeah, so so when when I when I experienced that physical addiction, it still wasn't I didn't have major consequences besides the physical addiction. What really escalated my and again, the drugs were my solution. Yeah. They were not my problem. Yeah. That's what yeah, really I I can only describe it that way. They were even though they were causing physical addiction, the drugs were my solution to life. Yeah. They were my answer to life. They're how you can function. Yeah, they were how I could be normal. Yeah. I couldn't be normal or feel normal without the drugs, mm. wow. regardless of the addiction. Like the drugs made me feel comfortable in my own skin. Felt I felt confident. I felt you know enthusiastic about life. It gave me you know vitality basically. Wow. So. When I finally ran out of pills and I could not find any oxys and I was going through withdrawal, my oxy dealer introduced me to heroin. Ugh. And again, like I said, you know, five minutes ago, I thought in, I would never in a million years try heroin. And I remember thinking that like, holy crap, Michael, are you gonna really try heroin? Like that seems like you're crossing a boundary in my mind. But the physical addiction was too strong. Like mm. I was so sick and my friend said, or my drug dealer, he wasn't a friend. <laughs> my drug dealer said, he's like, trust me, this is just like Oxy. You're gonna not feel sick anymore. And it's gonna be even better than Oxy. Mm. Just try it. And I remember in my mind, I'm like, Michael, you're crossing a line and I don't feel like you're ever gonna be able to come back, but I had to do it because of my sickness. Mm. So I remember snorting the heroin 
and immediately my my physical addiction was 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 cured and i wasn't sick anymore I was like, oh my God, like heroin was Oxy. And the Time Magazine article was accurate. Like Oxy is just a pharmaceutical grade heroin. Like it's as strong, it has the exact same properties, it makes you feel the exact same way. So in my mind, I was like, man, I was giving heroin a bad rap. Wow. <laughs> like, like it's not obviously that bad. It's just a, it's just a, you know, a powdered form of Oxy. But from there, like once I had that form of physical addiction and I was doing heroin, then I finally got introduced to the needle. Oh. And again, that, that same drug dealer said, Michael, you're wasting the heroin, like snorting it. You're like losing half of it when you snort it. You're not getting the full effect. Like you need to try this. And again, in my mind, I'm like, Michael, you're crossing a boundary. Oh. And I knew this vividly, like I'm not stupid. And I was still self-conscious, like I had consciousness that like shooting drugs is probably the worst thing you can do in my mind. But I was so dominated by this addiction at that point that the addiction was running the show, yeah. not me, like not my, yeah. not my conscious brain. And I tried the needle and again, it produced the exact same effect that I was looking for. And I'm like, oh my God, he's right. Like I'm not wasting the drugs. I can do less and, you know, and actually get a, a better effect from it. And that's when I just started rapidly going downhill. You know, I, I, I tried shooting heroin and then I was like, I'm only gonna shoot heroin now. I'm not gonna snort it or do anything else. And then I tried cocaine and I started shooting cocaine and became like radically addicted to that as well. And now I'm mixing all these substances Ugh. and just becoming like a full blown out of control drug addict. And like my whole waking hours revolved around getting drugs and seeking out drugs and doing drugs. And it really just blindsided me. Like I was a kid that was very, very good at school. Like school came very easy to me. I could excel, but I had that sense of emptiness. I had mm. that sense of not belonging, not knowing my identity, not knowing my authentic self. And having a void that big, mm. you know, there was no other solution but to fill that void. Yeah. And little did I know that filling that void would end up just ruining my life completely. And it blindsided me. Like I became this full blown drug addict that was out of control, like with the snap of my fingers. Like it just, okay. ha it happened so fast and out of nowhere. And I just hit, started to hit rock bottom and, and start to actually receive major consequences from that point forward. Like it went from no con consequences to very little consequences and then to extreme consequences where I had to get, um, I had to be in the hospital for a month. I remember I had just graduated high school. So I'm like 18 years old and I was shooting heroin. I could, I couldn't even make it to community college. Like my, I barely graduated high school, you know, because I skipped so much, not because my grades were bad, but because I had so many absences. And my dad paid for like a semester of community college, but I was so sick that I couldn't even make it to that first day, that first course. And I was shooting heroin and shooting co cocaine every day. And I developed an abscess on my arm. Huh. And like, I was so addicted. Like I said, the addiction had overcome yeah. my life. It was running your life. Yeah, that I didn't even address it. And it turned into like a really bad abscess to where I almost had to have my arm amputated. Oh my God. When I was 18 years old. Oh. Yeah. And I was in the hospital for like a month. And like, you would think that would be a wake up call, but it wasn't. Hmm. Like, from that point, my family find out, finally found out that I was like really badly addicted to drugs. They only thought before that I was like smoking weed and drinking and had like- They didn't know anything They didn't about know this? about the heroin or the, or the opiate addiction. They just thought I was a high school student that drank a lot or smoked a lot of weed. They didn't know how bad it had gotten. And you were living with your mother and there I was, was living no, with my mother. She didn't see any signs. No, because I was so rebellious and I just 
basically didn't listen to her at all. Mm. Like I would just stay out. I would always do my drugs outside of the house. And then when I would show up the next morning, I wouldn't be, you know, under the influence. So I would just hide it very well from wow. her and do things out of her, uh, you know, uh, point of view. Wow. So, but when that happened with with the abscess on my arm, I had to, my, or my mom said, yeah, I mean, it's obvious. you need to leave Austin. Like huh. you need to get away from these group of friends that you're using drugs with. And I moved in with my dad in California. And this is what I tell everybody in addiction. Like the addiction is inside of you. Yeah. It's not outside of yeah. you. So wherever you go, it your goes, addiction yeah. will follow you. Yeah, like, isn't there that quote, wherever you are, uh, wherever you go, there you are. Yes, and that's, that's so true with addiction. Yeah. Like the addiction just followed me to California and I just picked up right where I left off, mm. you know, when, when I got to California. Wow. So what event or experience started you on your journey to freedom? Like what, what was it that started turning the ship around? So, you know, it was a series of just radical rock bottoms, mm -hmm. you know, in all levels, physically, mentally, spiritually. Um, while I was in California, I had, um, you know, I just, my addiction just continued to progress. And I was, you know, going in and out of different rehabs, different outpatient oh, wow. rehabs and inpatient this rehabs. This is 18, 19 years. Yeah, this is 18, 19, 20. And throughout that process, like, I would get temporary jobs at, like, Starbucks or Ralph's or I would get these little jobs just to maintain my habit and to live at my dad's house. He said, like, you have to be working or in school, like, they just didn't know what to do with me, my my parents at all. So I'd get these little jobs, and then my mom in Austin had finally, uh, you know, found her career and her purpose and her identity. She was working at Bank of America, and throughout those years, of besides worrying about me, she would just like pour her heart into her work, and like that was a distraction for her, or at least give her, you know, a sense of like not having to worry about me all yeah, the time. some kind of stability. Yeah, some type of stability and focus. And she was working at Bank of America, and she connected with a gentleman who was Persian, and you know, I have, a, I have an Iranian background, her husband was Iranian, and she connected with this Iranian gentleman who had a computer uh, company where he would, you know, wholesale uh, refurbished computer equipment and hardware. And she became just like, a con he, she just was connected with him. She was his loan officer and would like do like loans, you know, real estate loans and different business mm -hmm. loans for him. And just he, she formed this relationship. Mm -hmm. And I don't know what like inspired her to do this, but she found out that he had, um, you know, a manufacturing facility and distribution center in Los Angeles. And she said, my son's living in, um, in, Cal in Southern California and he's half Iranian. Like she just had that connection, you know, me being Iranian and, and this uh, boss being Iranian. And she said, could he go interview with your company in California? And I had just like gotten out of rehab and I was like, just, I was staying, I was staying functioning. You know, I could go through periods where I could function, but I was still doing drugs at night and like doing drugs whenever I could. So whenever you got out of rehab, you just started doing drugs. Yeah, I'd no, I had no plans in my mind of getting sober. I was just going through the motions mm -hmm. and really people pleasing again, my mm -hmm. parents of, you so know. Why did you go to rehab? Like, was it? To people, please. To so your because, dad. Yeah, my mom and dad said, like, you have to go or we're going to kick you out. Uh, so, like, I was doing it for them, not for myself. So I go interview with this gentleman in California, and I immediately, I took drugs beforehand. Okay. And I had, you know, I felt connected. It filled the void. And I just poured my heart out to him. I'm like, hey, I can, you know, be great at this job. And I sold myself. <laughs> And got a job doing, uh, you know, at this company doing computer sales and wholesale electronics and selling refurbished, you know, uh, equipment. And the reason I share that story is because I had finally found something outside of drugs that would temporarily fill the void. 
And even though I continued using drugs during that time, I, I felt like it wasn't comparable to drugs, but it was a number two, you know, sense of, of belonging and, 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 and just filling a, another void in my life where I could see that, oh, you're good at this. I became very good at sales. I became very, you know, s successful at selling um, the computer hardware and, you know, just, you know, being, you know, very productive in that and outselling all the other people that worked with me. And again, that praise that I got from my boss felt very good. And it just gave me that sense that, you know, fake sense of belonging mm. and feeling like, man, this can be my purpose now mm. is, is this career and something you're good at. And it's something that looks good on paper. You're not working at, you know, a grocery store or a, you're not a barista, which is all the jobs I had before because I didn't have a college education. You know, I never went to college, but this seemed like something that was very admirable and something that I could build a career off of. And that temporarily, like I said, filled my void. But my addiction still trumped everything. And throughout that process, like one of the most pivotal things that happened to me was, again, shooting drugs. I developed, um, you know, bacteria got into the syringe mm. and you know, through shooting drugs, I, it, it developed a staph infection in my heart. Oh, wow. Yeah. And, and through that process, I had to get hospitalized and I had endocarditis. Okay. That was the disease that was, um, that manifested from the staph infection that got into my bloodstream. And they gave me truly like a less than 50% chance of surviving. Wow. You, it kills people because your heart shuts down. And I had like 50, I had over 50% heart failure. Oh my goodness. And, and this is like 20, you're 20 years yeah, old. Yeah, I'm like 22 years old. And they had to move me from the emergency room. I remember it vividly. I was in a detox center, you know, trying to detox myself off of drugs. And I had this staph infection. And I thought it was just a normal staph infection on my arm. But I was in the middle of my detox and then I just like collapsed onto the ground oh. and developed 105 fever, which is also very dangerous. And then they rushed me into the into the you know ER that was connected to the detox, and they were doing blood work and found out that I had wow. this staff that was attacking my heart. And I remember it vividly, like I was in the emergency room for two weeks, and they're giving me IV antibiotics to try and kill this infection, but they can't keep you in an ER for you know, weeks and weeks at a time. And I had to get moved to a hospice care. Hmm. And I got moved to this hospice care in Austin, Texas. Make a long story short, I had moved back to Austin. And um, and I, I had to get moved to this hospice care. And I remember it vividly. I'm in this hospital with all 80 plus year old people that are on their deathbed mm -hmm. and I'm 22 years old mm -hmm. and I'm like how did I end up like this I'm 22 years old and I'm in an old person's you know hospice assisted living care where they're getting ready to die they're like ending their life you know naturally and getting taken care of and I'm a 22 year old like on my deathbed because still they didn't know if I was going to live or not if the antibiotics didn't work and didn't kill that infection, I would have died. And I had to stay in that hospice for five weeks, hmm. be bedridden for five weeks. Wow. And this is how badly addicted I was. They're giving me the IV antibiotics. I would have my drug dealers sneak in to the oh hospital and shoot drugs into my IV. Oh my goodness. Yeah. I would shoot drugs when the nurses would leave the room. I would sneak drugs and mix them up and then connect it to the syringe and shoot drugs in my IV. That's how bad my addiction got. So that was something that was a pivotal point where I remember like, Michael, like there's no further down you can go. I Obviously I survived that. After five weeks, the antibiotics did kill the infection and I was discharged and- But the addiction was still there. This, the addiction was still there. I started using again right oh. after the hospital. Like nothing could stop me from using because I didn't have a solution. Drugs and alcohol, no matter how much pain they caused, were still my solution to functioning in life. Mm. 
And I was living in Austin. I had just got out of the hospital. And again, this Persian gentleman that owned that computer company, he remember he had a mm -hmm. he had LA. a facility in LA and he had a facility in Austin. That's where my mom met him. So I transferred to his facility in Austin. And that guy was like an angel. He would give me second chances, third chances, fourth chances. And he knew I was struggling. Like it was so obvious. You know, I was I was honest with him. You know, him and my parents, I finally was honest with, with those individuals in my life. And I told him, I said, I said, Alex, please give me another shot. I had just got out of the hospital and I, he gave me a job again because I would just like disappear mm. during my addiction because I would go on a spree and just not show up to work or have to get hospitalized. I was hospitalized so many times in my early 20s because of addiction, like. It was just so bad. So he gave me another chance and like temporarily, like I wasn't using as much, but my addiction would ramp up and I'd go on a spree and then get, you know, get laid off from work because I would disappear. And through that process of getting laid off so many times, he finally said, he's like, Michael, I can't, you know, it looks bad to the other employees yeah, that you disappear and you have this like special treatment that we always hire you back. And I said, Alex, I totally understand. Um, but I was just like so caught up with my addiction that like I still couldn't stop. And through that process, I was obviously in sales and I had, you know, my cell phone and I would have customers call my cell phone. And I remember I had just gotten like fired or laid off from the company. And this gentleman calls my phone like a week later because he thought I had still worked at the company. Mm -hmm. I would do sales around the US. Mm -hmm. You know, I would sell computer parts um, around the US and even internationally. And this gentleman called me. He doesn't know what's going on in the company or in my life. And he's like, hey, Michael, can you look up this part? Can you see if, uh, you know, Image has it? Image was the company that I had worked for. And I said, I said, I said, Mayor, the gentleman's name was Mayor. I said, Mayor, you know, I'm actually not working at that company anymore. And I don't know how this came out of my mouth, but I said, I started my own company. And I was just like under the influence and like <laughs> not knowing what I'm doing and being jobless for a week. But I said, Mayor, I'm starting my own company and I can try and find you that part. And it was just like something that I don't know, it was like a knee jerk reaction to his phone call. Wow. And when I hung up the phone with him, I started like researching like my old emails that 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 from from the company and just like I had built connections over the years from being in that industry that I found the part he was looking for and I said Mayor, I had, I found the part. Like, how many do you want? And he was like, I want a thousand pieces. And it was like, it's like a fifty thousand dollar order. And I oh said, I said, okay, no problem. Just wire me the money and I'll and I'll get it for you. And I was just like so, and I had built such a good connection with my customers over the years, even while I was under the influence and like going through wow. this horrible drug addiction. And he said, okay, send me your your wire info. And I said, I asked my mom, I'm like, mom, send me my, you know, give me a copy of my bank account information and in my, because I'd never received a wire transfer. I'm just like. And you oh. don't even have a company. It's no, just I like don't your even personal have a, Yeah, I don't account. even have a company at all. And she's like, why? What's going on? Like, she thought I was up to some like scheme. <laughs> and I'm like, no, one of my old customers from Image is wanting to buy parts. And I had found it for him. And I send him my information. He's like, he's like, you don't have a company. This is your personal wire information. And he basically <laughs> just like gave me a shot. He's like, Michael, go set up a, a DBA oh. and, and then I'll wire you the money so I can at least have my invoices proper. So I went and signed up a DBA. And the first name that came to my head was MHD Enterprises because it was my initials, Michael Hassan Dadashi Enterprises. And I don't know why, I just like did things like spontaneously. <laughs> and I set up the DBA for MHD Enterprises and I got the wire transfer, it was like $52,000. <laughs> and I wired the other company the money and basically I was a broker. That was like how I started MHD, just brokering deals. And I remember like I added 10% onto the deal and like when I wired the money, I wired like 40, 6,000 and then I kept the Delta, which was like $6,000. So I was like, oh my God, I just made $6,000 in a day. I was like, 
oh my God, this is amazing. Like it would have taken me months to make that at the company I was working at. And it just like clicked for me. I'm like, oh my God, I can start this business. And I just started MHD Enterprises. You know, I got a, an LLC, but I just learned, I just started researching while I'm high on like how to start a business. And I'm 23 years old, chronically addicted to heroin and cocaine and crack. Like I was just a rock bottom drug addict still. And, you know, then I started making money. You know, one thing that I can say, and it's, you know, it's still something that, you know, is very firm in my principles is no matter what, while I was in my addiction, when I started my company or when I worked for the old company, I would never rip people off. Mm. Like, I don't know why there was something I could be completely blacked out on heroin, but if somebody wired me the money, I would always fulfill, I would never steal their yeah, money. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. No matter what, and that, you know, that is what served me on giving me the ability to start MHD is because I never burned any of my customers or mm-hmm. vendors or or I would lie to them. <laughs> you know, I'd, I'd be delayed on shipments and I, they'd be like, where's my stuff? And I'd make up, I would lie to them because I was an addict and I couldn't control my behavior, mm. but I would never rip them off. And, you know, that is what really fueled my addiction was having access to that kind of money, finally. You know, having $5,000, $10,000 be, being wired to me and, and and having that access, you know, my addiction just started ramping up even more. And I was still living at my mom's house or bouncing around, you know, staying with friends or, you know, renting a spare bedroom from one of my friends that had a two bedroom apartment. And like, you know, I would go through these sprees in in my in my in my you know in my using days that I would hit again like a catastrophic rock bottom where I flipped a car and had to get cut out of the car by the jaws of life because I was like you know basically drove off of a nine foot embankment blacked out on oxycotton and Xanax completely blacked out and woke up hanging from my seatbelt upside down. Mm. I had driven off of a nine foot embankment. And that was, after that, I checked myself immediately into rehab. And I checked myself into a state funded rehab in Austin, Texas called Austin Recovery. You know, I applied for their grant program because I didn't have any money. Even though I was making a lot of, what I considered a lot of money at that time, it all went to drugs and I didn't have W-2 income. I didn't have health insurance. I didn't have any resources. And I applied for this grant and I remember saying like, cause there was a waiting list. Like a lot of people were applying to get a bed at this recovery center. And the lady said, well, what drugs are you using? Like share about your daily use. And I said that I was, you know, an IV heroin user an IV cocaine user. And she said, oh, you're going to get bumped up on the list because they wanted to get IV drug users in fastest because it was the most life threatening, mm-hmm. you know, more than alcoholism and, and, and other drugs. So I got on the waiting list and after a week and a half, they called me and said, you know, we have a bed for you. And that was the start of my spiritual awakening. Mm-hmm. I don't know why, but at that time going to rehab, I actually wanted to get sober. Before, I had never wanted to get sober. I was doing it to people, please, and just give my parents, you know, I get my parents off my back Mm. and give them something they wanted. It wasn't what I wanted. But finally, when I went through the process of getting on the list to get the grant, I did all that on my own. It wasn't my family. They were really just at their wits end with me. Yeah, they so didn't they know what like to do. They sending you to rehab. Yeah, and they weren't sending me money anymore because I was making my own money through MHD. You know, they were just very disconnected from me because mm. I was just, I was so heartbreaking to them. Mm. Like my mom told me she would just like wake up in the middle of the night and just throw up mm. with anxiety because she didn't know if she was gonna get a call the next morning that I was dead. You know, and I went through so many near-death experiences with the endocarditis, with flipping the car, that like, I should have been dead so many of those times that it was just 
too stressful and heartbreaking to my family. And they were just really disconnected from me. They would only call me to check in or my mom would say, come have dinner so I can see you and like, just, you know, see that you're alive and okay. But finally, you know, me going through the process of initiating the grant and getting into Austin recovery, like I finally wanted to get sober. I was at the point where I knew the drugs and alcohol were not working for me. And I don't know why it took so, it took, it took eight years up until that point for me to finally wake up to, hey, drugs and alcohol, the pain outweighs the euphoria. Like finally it was painful enough where I said, you have to stop, Michael. Like you're gonna die and I didn't wanna die or you're gonna have a catastrophic life event. Like I was just so crystal clear on that that like drugs and alcohol had to not be in my vocabulary anymore. Do you think that's just because you grew up a little bit or what do you, what do you think? No, the- it's because, and I know this about addiction now because I've studied addiction, you know, you know, all of the intricacies of addiction and alcoholism and alcoholism and addiction has a life cycle. Mm -hmm. And the life cycle starts out with, it's your solution, right? It only causes uh, positive, it only gives you positive um, uh, results. Then the life cycle spreads to where it still has positive results, but there's consequences. And then the full life cycle goes to it's the majority is consequences and very little positive results. Mm. Then it goes to the final stage of alcoholism, which is when people like hit their final rock bottom, which is it's all consequences and no positive experiences. And that's what I was, I was at that third stage where it was the majority consequences, but still little bits of positive, um, you know, um, influences. Uh, in- influences. So I had finally wanted to get clean because the dr- I knew the drugs and alcohol were not working for me anymore. And they were, there was more negatives than positives. But again, this alcoholism and this addiction was inside of me. It was in my DNA. It was like this entity this demonic entity that needed to get addressed like at its root. And going to rehab, you know, especially if it's a rehab that isn't properly armed with the tools, uh, the spiritual tools, the psychological tools, you know, the therapeutic tools, the disciplinary tools, if they're not armed with those, which Austin Recovery they tried their hardest, but it was a nonprofit and they would give grants to people for their, they had limited resources. And it was really just three hots and a cot. Mm -hmm. That's what we call it. Three hots, you get three hot meals, you get a bed to sleep in and you stay there 30 days and it removes you from society. Mm -hmm. You know, you're in a 24 seven inpatient facility, you can't use drugs. So it removes you for 30 days and it like breaks that physical addiction. Mm. But they never got to the root of my problem. You know, they never they never removed the tumor. All it was was giving me medicine that masked the uh, the symptoms. But it's just like addiction is like cancer. If you don't remove the tumor and like do a, a surgery that gets all of the tumor out of your body and all of the cancer cells out of your body, like that cancer will will, will come alive again and start multiplying. Mm-hmm. And that's what happened with addiction, with my addiction. I checked out of rehab, but my cancer was still there. And I still couldn't, no matter how much I wanted to stay clean, I couldn't stop myself from taking that first drink, mm-hmm. from taking that first drug. Addiction. And this is after you basically applied for the grant and got yes. yourself in. Yes. So even with all that, you yeah. still. I checked into a sober living the day I got out of rehab. And I remember I applied for that grant and got that grant to get into a sober living home. And I remember it vividly. My second day in the sober living home, I had this mental blind spot where I was walking past the 7-Eleven and I just walked in there and bought alcohol. Mm. 
And like, I couldn't stop myself. And that's what addiction is. Addiction is centers in your mind, not in your body. So I was physically removed from the drugs for 30 days. So I wasn't physically craving the drugs, but I still had this mental obsession and I still never addressed the problem that I had when I was nine years old, 10 years old, 11 years old. That was the root of my problem that had never been addressed. So even at 24 years old, 23 years old, getting out of rehab, being 30 days sober, I'm still uncomfortable in my own skin. I still feel disconnected from my peers. I still am driven by fear and anxiety and you know feelings of hopelessness and uselessness in this world. And I tried to start, you know, start MHD again. You know, after I got out of rehab, I was calling all my old customers and like, you know, I would get some traction, but that didn't fill my void. It would temporarily for a day, like I would That's make a exciting. deal and it would give me a sense of euphoria. Mm -hmm. But then the euphoria wears off so fast. And then the next day I'm just like chasing the next deal. So because I never addressed the root of my problem, I had that mental blind spot. You know, I felt so uncomfortable in my own skin and you, my mind immediately knows what will fix that. It knows, Michael, you drink this 40 ounce of beer, you're gonna feel comfortable. Mm. You're gonna, your shoulders can drop and you won't be so worried about the future. You won't be so worried about making that phone call that mm. you need to make. Like I was just paralyzed by fear in life. And that's how I was when I was a kid, you know? And I didn't have drugs and alcohol when I was nine, 10 years old. So I would just, you know, like I said, be a chameleon, act out or, you know, give the group of friends what they wanted to hear. So they felt, you know, so they invited me to their, you know, parties or they, you know, hung out with me and played with me. And that at that time filled that void. But I'm out of rehab and I don't have a solution to my problems and I start using again. And I used for like another six months and my addiction always starts where I take that beer, I was 30 days sober, drink the beer and I'm like, oh my God, I can't, you know, go into full blown addiction again. But that's not the way addiction yeah, works. Like course. it doesn't, di you can't dictate the how you can't how it progresses yeah how it progresses how, yeah. it's driving the sh yeah. the ship not you so what what was the thing that started to turn that ship around like so then finally i applied for the grant again and went back to the same recovery center oh wow yeah like 9 months 6 months later i go back to the same recovery center and now this time i even have more of a desire and willingness to get sober like i'm like Man, this first time at Austin Recovery inpatient, that was my first inpatient treatment. I'd always gone to outpatient treatments before. So it's I'm like- It's amazing that they give you a second chance. And a yeah, I got the grant again. Wow. And <clears throat> this time I'm like, man, I have to do something different. I relapsed on day two mm -hmm. after getting out of Austin Recovery the first time in a sober living. I gotta do something different. And, you know, people in the recovery center, again, they didn't address the root of my problem, but they said, Michael, you need to start attending AA meetings. Like mm -hmm. immediately when you get out, start attending AA meetings, get a sponsor and really get immersed in the recovery community. Mm -hmm. And again, I really had a desire to get clean. So that's what I did. I got out of, um, I got out of uh, rehab. And I immediately started going to AA meetings every day, every day, every day. And I got a sponsor, but I still had my own ideas of what I needed to do or what I was willing to do or what I believed would work mm -hmm. in my life to stay clean and sober. Like I wasn't willing to totally listen to a sponsor and just say, you know what? I don't know how to stay sober. You tell me everything to do. And I don't want to like, I don't want to, you know, do things other than what you're telling me to do. I still had my own ideas and opinions. Mm -hmm. So I get out, get this sponsor. And he's telling me like, you know, start the step work, do this, do that. And I just didn't take it 
seriously. Like, I thought if you go to AA meetings every day and you're around that group of friends and you restart your company and you start like living a normal life and now that you're sober, you can continue running the company and, and grow it and become successful, that'll keep you sober, Michael. Like, you're hanging around sober people, you're going to AA meetings every day, you're gonna be successful in your company, that will keep you sober. Like, I was convinced of it. Nobody could, could have convinced me otherwise. And it did work, hmm. it worked. It worked for nine months. Wow. So for nine months, I didn't pick up one drug and wow. or one alcohol. And that was the longest I had ever had in my life. So all these things are happening fast. I had started my secondary e-commerce business. I went and got a warehouse where I could like buy wholesale parts, store them, and then ship them out in smaller quantities to different customers. And I'm like on month four, month five, month six of my sobriety, I'm like, man, look at me, it's working. Like I'm on five months of sobriety. I'm going to AA meetings every day. My business is like skyrocketing. Like I had never had my business do so good because I'd never been sober that long. Like the most I could put together is 48 hours. Wow. So like you can only do so much with a business if you're, yeah. you know, blacked out on heroin. So as the months went on, that screw was still tightening. That screw that I had always been dealing with since I was eight, nine, 10, 11, 12 years old. I had never addressed the root of the problem. And a job, being an entrepreneur, hanging around sober people, that does not address the root of the problem. That's just branches of the tree. It's not the root. So that screw, unbeknownst to me, was tightening, 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 tightening. And I remember month five, month six, month seven, looking back now, I remember like, man, I would wake up in the morning and again, I'm stone cold sober. Like I haven't used drugs in five months, no alcohol in five months. And I would wake up in my bed paralyzed by fear. Huh. Like fear of the unknown, fear, like I didn't wanna get out of bed. Like it was just this feeling of like, man, I don't wanna go face, you know, society. I don't wanna go face the world. and. I would finally convince myself like, get out of bed because my phone would ring and it would be a customer or something. And I'd answer it and just put on that facade like, oh, hey, how's it going? Like, I can get you this product, no worries. And like, that would get me out of bed. And I would put on a facade to my parents like, they only saw the outside that I was successful at MHD. Obviously they could see that I was sober. Like they could tell I was sober and they were so proud of me, they were like, Oh my God, Michael, you finally beat your addiction. You're successful at your job now. And that's that gave me like also a sense of 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 it temp that temporarily filled the void too. Yeah. Getting praise from my parents and you're knowing getting, you're getting the fix from something. Yeah, I'm getting a fix. I'm getting a fix. It's not drugs anymore, but it's it's uh people yes. pleasing. And yes, it was people pleasing and 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 admiration. So these would always temporarily fill the void. But again, the screw is tightening inside of me. Like I had never solved the, the, the spiritual sickness, the spiritual cancer was still inside of me mm. and it was still growing and spreading. So month five, month six, month seven, you know, I would get in an argument with, with somebody, you know, at, you know, one of my customers or a vendor or something, or one of the, my friends in AA, and I would just replay the argument in my mind, like for days. Hmm. And this is what untreated alcoholism looks like. You're irritable, restless, and discontent. Hmm. You're full of fear. Oh. You know, you're, you, you have feelings of hopelessness. You have feelings of, 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 of not being um, connected to your peers, you know, and that's, that was the feeling that I've always had since I was a youth. Mm -hmm. So I'd replay these arguments in my head and I was just driven by these negative emotions of resentment, fear, anxiety, and the screw just kept tightening and tightening and tightening. And it just finally popped. Mm -hmm. Again, mental blind spot, 
you know, I drank alcohol again after being sober okay. and 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 having all of these praise from my family and like being so successful from what I thought at, at, at MHD and growing that business and having a warehouse and having, you know, this huge e-commerce division. I had, I had, I had just, you know, without any thought of the consequences, any, you know, any proper, you know, per decision making of Michael, you shouldn't do this alcoholism doesn't work like that. It makes the decision for you. And I picked up that, the, 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 whatever it was, I think it was liquor at the time I ended up getting liquor and I drank that after being sober for nine months and it filled the void. Ugh. It did what it always did my whole life. It filled that void temporarily. And again, my shoulders dropped and I finally felt man, I don't need to replay resentment in my head. Like I can finally, you know, not be scared to face society and have to put on this facade. You know, alcohol and drugs gave me the ability to not put on a facade. <laughs> I could be my authentic self. Mm. And it's this vicious cycle where you have this spiritual malady, the screw's tightening, the screw finally pops, sets off the mental obsession, then you obsess about, giving yourself that solution to your spiritual problems. You act on that mental obsession. You pick up the alcohol and drugs. You use them repeatedly, and then you become physically addicted, and then you hit rock bottom, and it's like just a cycle mm. that goes on and on and on. Mm. And I remember I was using for three months straight after having those nine months of sobriety and having this business that's skyrocketing, the whole three months, I knew every time I picked up the drugs and alcohol that I was making the worst decision of my life. I couldn't believe that I was doing this. And I just was like totally against using, but I couldn't stop. Like addiction just overpowers any logic and any decision making and any bit of willpower. Al alcoholism and addiction has nothing to do with willpower. And that's what I always thought that it was willpower. Mm -hmm. Like if I have enough willpower and I have enough success in my life, I will be able to say no to drugs and alcohol. And it just doesn't work like that. So after three months, I finally hit a spiritual rock bottom. Mm -hmm. Like I can't describe it in any other way. It wasn't a flipped car. It wasn't a heart infection that got me hospitalized. Mm -hmm. I'm in my condo shooting heroin, smoking crack cocaine, Ugh. and just like completely miserable. The drugs and alcohol stopped working. They stopped working. Wow. So I had no positive effect from them anymore. Wow. I would take a hit of crack cocaine and it would not give me the euphoria. Huh. It just would not give me the hit, the dopamine rush, the hit. Wow. I was on heroin and you had I could, built some kind of immunity to them. Yeah, and what it did, it stopped filling the void. It stopped working. Drugs and alcohol were always my solution. They stopped working. And at that point in my in my using and in my, you know, you know, progression of addiction, I was at a jumping off place where I couldn't picture my life with drugs and alcohol anymore. But I still couldn't picture them without drugs and alcohol anymore. It's like both. I couldn't picture them with, and I couldn't picture them without. But they stopped working. And that was when I just hit my knees and had this like radical epiphany, spiritual awakening, whatever you want to call it. I called my old sponsor in AA, high on crack, high on heroin. I had been using in this like radical relapse for three months. I called my old sponsor and said, I don't want to use anymore. I'm done. He came over to my house. He blew up an air mattress and slept at my house for three days just to like monitor me. He's like, Michael, I'm going to help keep you accountable so you don't use anymore. I flushed all my drugs down the toilet and I had just had this radical like spiritual awakening from that rock bottom that Drugs and alcohol are no longer my solution. 
And then I just like followed his steps. Like he said, Michael, this is what you need to do if you want to get to the root of your problem, if you finally want to beat addiction for good and for all. And you know what? I was finally painted into a corner. And I told this sponsor, I said, Paul, I'll do whatever you say. Like huh. I'm out of ideas. My ideas don't work. Like what I thought was a solution, getting a nice condo, getting a car, having a successful business, it doesn't make me happy. Like I thought all those things, and that's like what society teaches us. Like if you're successful, you get, you know, you know, a you know, big house, a fancy car, you have your own business, you're an entrepreneur, it's the American dream, you will be happy. And I mean, the results were evident, at least for me. Maybe it makes some people happy. It did not make me happy. I was miserable the whole time. And I told Paul, I said, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. And I just went through a 12-step recovery process. I worked the 12 steps that are out of AA. And really, I can't say enough of how radically effective those 12 steps are. They really do get to the root of addiction and get to the root of what is the cancer. They identify the cancer and then they remove the cancer through, through spiritual surgery, basically. And through that process, you have to admit to yourself fully that you do suffer from substance use disorder, alcoholism, and surrender to that. You know, what I've learned over the years is that one common theme in all religions and in the 12-step process is surrender. Mm -hmm. Surrender is such an important word. It's such an important mindset to have. I finally surrendered to my addiction and said, you know what, I'm not gonna be able to just have willpower or beat this on my own. I need something greater than myself mm -hmm. because whatever I do does not work. And my, my ideas of a solution do not work. And I surrendered. And then I went through the 12 step recovery process. I uncovered all of my childhood fears. I uncovered all of my childhood resentments that had been buried inside of me and that had been bottled up and like, you know, you know, dug so deep into the sand. I uncovered all of those and did a radical self-analysis on every, every fear that I've ever dealt with my mm -hmm. whole life, every resentment that I've ever dealt with, every insecurity that I had dealt, that I had been suffering from my whole life. I identified those on paper mm -hmm. and basically, you know, saw them for what they were, admitted them to somebody else. I told my, I shared them with my sponsor. Then he shared the perspective of looking at it through a spiritual lens and why these are not serving me to have these resentments, have these fears. I could finally see it through a third party spiritual lens. Michael, these are not serving you. I could trace back that each one of those fears and resentments was a domino that knocked over all these other dots. It set this ball in motion of me making bad decisions, of me acting on a fear that led me to more, you know, pain and suffering and heartache, which eventually leads you back to drugs and alcohol. Mm -hmm. Like you suffer enough inside, you're gonna use drugs and alcohol if you're if you're an alcoholic or drug addict. Mm -hmm. So I uncovered all of those things. And then another key part of the 12 steps is making amends. I wrote out a list of everybody I had harmed throughout my old life. Mm -hmm. My old boss, my mom, my dad, my sisters. You know, everybody in my life, stores I had stole from. You know, I would steal like like razor blades from, from Ralph's or Walgreens or whatever and then go return them and get gift cards. When I was younger, when I was in like high school, mm -hmm. I went to those stores and admitted to them that I had stole from them. I'm like, hey, can I talk to the manager? I, I'm... I'm in recovery and I'm, you know, five months sober, but in my addiction, I would steal from your store, probably stole like a couple hundred dollars. Is there any way I can repay it? Wow. And they would say like, we've never had anybody tell us that they've <laughs> stole from us. And there's really no way to take in that money. Like we don't have a journal entry <laughs> on our bookkeeping. 
So they're like, why don't you make a donation to like the Heart <laughs> Foundation or whatever they they're yeah. the you know homeless uh, you know bags at grocery stores. So I was just like, okay, I want to donate two hundred bucks, and like I would every time I would go to the store, I would donate two hundred bucks, donate a hundred bucks, donate you know, and I just do that for like the whole first year of sobriety, make donations to all these different stores. But you know what? It was the fact that I that I stepped through that fear, you know, it wasn't about the money. It was the fact that I took the action, mm -hmm. you know, and something shifted inside of me through the 12 step recovery process of taking action that I was uncomfortable taking, mm. taking action that I didn't even agree with sometimes like i'm like why would i go tell a store that i stole from them and risk getting arrested how is that going to help me but after i did it i felt so good about myself and i started to build self esteem yeah. i started to i started to feel pr a pride in myself that man you're doing something honorable i i i stopped having feelings of shame of shame and and basically, I pitied myself before. I was like, man, you're just a bad person. I really looked at myself always through the lens of, man, Michael, you're a really bad person. Mm. Like, you hurt your family. You're selfish. You, like, do all these things. You're a bad person. That view of myself started to shift. And through the 12-step recovery process, I finally got to see addiction for what it really is which is a disease. It's not a moral failing. And I always thought that addiction was a moral failing. Like I'm just a bad person and I hurt people. And you know, why can't I stop hurting people? Why are you such a selfish bad person? Mm -hmm. But I could finally see addiction for what it was. It's a disease. It's just like cancer. Like if somebody has cancer and they're, you know, you know, uh, in bedridden and they can't help with household chores. It's not because they're selfish. It's because they have cancer and they're on their deathbed and they have no cho choice. That truly is how addiction is. Mm -hmm. When you're in the grip of addiction and you're using compulsively, you're doing it when you don't want to do it. It's, it's something you cannot control. It overpowers your life. It is like cancer or diabetes. There's no, and the, the medicine is the drugs and alcohol. Then after that amends process, another, uh, the last three steps of the 12 steps is prayer and meditation and service. Hmm. And those three things really radically changed my life. And I started to build a relationship with myself and with the God that was within me. I believe that God is inside of me and is inside of you and is inside of everybody. I believe, and this is just my own personal belief, I believe that everybody has a God or a sense of higher power that's deep in their heart, right? It's inside of them. And I finally connected to that God that was inside of me. I finally connected to my spirit. Mm -hmm. And I finally was able to have authentic conversations, which what is what prayer is to me. Prayer, I believe, is a conversation with God. Then meditation is me listening to God and hearing what God you know, wants me to do, sending me the, the subconscious thoughts of you know, what his will is for me, basically. So I formed this relationship with God and I started doing service work. I started giving back in the community. I followed every direction that my sponsor told me. Mm. Again, I had no more ideas. I was out of ideas. And I finally surrendered to the process. So I started volunteering and I started going back to Austin Recovery, the place that I was a patient at, and doing surface meetings where I would set up my own AA meeting with the people that were in the detox wow. center. And they're like three days sober, four days sober, five days sober, and I'm six months sober. And I would share them, hey guys, I've got six months sobriety. I was in your shoes, you know, a year ago, you can do it. And just like being there altruistically to serve other people. Yeah, cheerleading. Yes, and the feelings that I would get leaving that recovery center after doing an hour and a half of service work, 
I felt that sense of euphoria that mm -hmm. drugs gave me, yeah. that drugs and alcohol gave me. I finally had filled the void that was inside of me and I finally got to the root of my problem and surgically removed that cancer. So simultaneously to that, to my recovery process, my business was skyrocketing. I started, you know, really scaling the business within that first year of sobriety. Like my whole life was recovery number one and business number two. But I knew I had a different perspective on business. My perspective wasn't that this is gonna solve my problems or give me happiness. It was just because I liked doing it and I enjoyed doing it and it obviously supported me, right? Everybody needs to support themselves. So that was the perspective shift that I formed a new relationship with my business. Yeah. It wasn't my identity anymore. It wasn't something that I was using as a drug to make me happy, which is the way I always viewed business. Like if I'm successful, if I use this drug of capitalism or, or, or business, it's gonna give me the fix like cocaine gives you. So I formed a new relationship. I said, man, business is just a vehicle for me to, you know, you know, be happy, be useful, you know, support myself, support others. I started hiring people and my business was growing so fast that I didn't know how to get employees because I needed more and more employees. <laughs> yeah, so I'd be at the detox center sharing my story and I don't know why, but my sixth sense kicked in. I'm like, I should offer employment to people that are graduating. Oh. So I'd, I'd leave my number on the board and I'd say, guys, your recovery is number one, but people need work and connection yeah. when they get out and of rehab. And they need to feel valued. They yes, need a sense they, of purpose. Yes, they need a sense of purpose. They need a sense of community. You know, work provides community as well. So I said, guys, whenever you check out of rehab, here's my number, call me and I'll interview you and give you a shot. And man, my phone started blowing up. You know, people were graduating. I connected with other recovery centers. And I started hiring people, you know, hire two this week, hire three this week. And I built up this staff of like 40 people. Wow. Over 24 months, like every month I would hire more and more people and I would train them in sales. Like I would train them in um, eBay and Amazon. I would train them on shipping because I had done every role throughout my throughout my addiction and throughout my journey of, you know, uh, learning this business. So I'd, I'd set up all these different roles for people that were fresh out of rehab. And man, what ended up like the epiphany that I had was, man, not only is work like a vehicle for me to support myself and like, you know, um, just provide for myself, but work is a vehicle to help other people. Mm -hmm. Work is actually a vehicle to give other people a second chance, to give other people a shot at a career, to give people another sense of purpose yeah. and community. And I started now having even this other layer of perspective on business, that business can be a vehicle to help make a positive impact yeah. in the world and make a positive impact in people's lives. So I started, you know, again, I built up a whole staff of like 95% of people in recovery. We had about 40 to 50 people, give or take, all in recovery. We would start our mornings with morning meditation. And like, I was just so flexible if people needed to go visit their parole officer, or people needed to go to an AA meeting during the day, because I, I was in their shoes there. before. I'm like take off, you know, you can make your own schedule that revolves around your recovery. Mm -hmm. And that's what really attracted people wow. to work in MHD is that I was empathetic yeah. and supportive of their recovery because that's the number one most important thing. You know, if you don't have your recovery, you don't have anything. So yeah, we just formed this amazing work culture and community. And as the years progressed, I got a bigger warehouse and then a bigger warehouse. And like my business was just skyrocketing. <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah. And I remember it so clearly. I was like, I was emailing this uh, customer and he emailed me back. And I noticed something had changed on his signature page. It said like, 
Inc. 5000 recipient or Inc. 5000 um, honoree. And I was like, whoa, that's so cool. Like, how did this guy get in Inc. 5000? I just, I grew up reading like Entrepreneur Magazine <laughs> and Inc. Magazine and Forbes because I was always so obsessed with business growing up. I don't know, it was just in my genes. Like when I was a little kid, I would form these little, uh, you know, projects during my summer vacation when I would be in uh, California visiting my father where we lived in a cul-de-sac and I would tell my dad, at the time it was Price Club, it wasn't even Costco. I told my dad, go to Price Club and get, you know, a box of Hershey bars or a box of Snickers, like wholesale, and I wanna go door to door and sell them. So I was already like, you know, being a little entrepreneur when I was like nine, 10, 11 years old. And I would tell the kids in the neighborhood because I was like really good at skateboarding and they wanted me to teach them skateboarding. I'm like, I'll teach you how to skateboard if you sell these candy bars with me. <laughs> so it's already like getting like, you know, the younger kids that were six, seven <laughs> years old and they were cuter than me at the time. So they would go to door to door and they would close deals. That's amazing. You know, and then I would bundle it with a car wash. I'm like, hey, well, while I've got an active, you know, customers selling them candy bar, offer them a car wash and, you know, $10 for the outside, 20 for the inside out. So I was always very interested in, in just entrepreneurship and ways to make profit. Profit and tree, I was like, man, this is so cool. You can turn nothing into something, you know? Um, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm emailing this customer and I see Inc. 5000 honoree. And I'm like, man, I'm gonna apply to Inc. 5000. That's just is so <laughs> cool. A magazine I read my whole life. Then they reply back and I had sent them all my tax returns and everything. Cause I was like a legit business at this point. You know, I'm three years sober now. I have 40 employees and I'm like doing things by the book and, and actually running a business. So I, I, I send them my tax returns and then they, they email me back and they're like, you know, you're gonna be in Inc. 5000, like you've hit the cutoff. You've hit the, um, the, the numbers that that you need, you are one of the 5,000 fastest growing companies in the US, private companies amazing. in the US. I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. They're like, tell us a little bit of how you did it. And I just shared my story with them. And they're like, would you mind if we sent, um, you know, a, a journalist and a, and a photographer to your warehouse to, to interview? I'm like, oh, of course you can. <laughs> so little did I know they, they came to the warehouse, took photos and like interviewed me and different employees of mine. And I just thought like, that's what they do with everybody, like with all of their different things. Then like a couple months later, the magazine comes out and the, the uh, editor emails me and says, hey, Michael, we featured you in the magazine. It's out on newsstands now. And I went and picked up the magazine <laughs> and I was like, had a two page spread <laughs> in ink bags. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me? <laughs> like I had to pinch myself. That's I was amazing. three years sober or two and a half years sober off of heroin. So inspiring. Yeah, and then I pick up magazine. I'm in Ink Magazine, like a magazine I'd read my whole life. And I was 28th in the nation, fastest growing companies, fastest growing private companies in the US. I'm like, I'm 28th in the nation. Not only was I Ink 5000, I was Ink 500 and like wow. in the top 50. It's like, man, this is incredible. Like. That's amazing. Like, that just speaks to kind of the the power of of your resilience, your strength, you know, all of it, right? You yeah, just, and just really, it's God. I really <laughs> attribute it to God. And that's my own personal belief. Like, I'm not trying to push God on anybody, but me forming a relationship with God and letting God run the show instead of Michael mm -hmm. running the show and try to be, trying to be a servant for him and my higher power and making decisions based on what God's will is for me instead of my will, mm -hmm. instead of, you know, just what I want to do. That is what I attribute to my success. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, God had bigger plans for me than I even realized. Mm -hmm. Like if I made a wish list of what I wanted in 2009 of my sobriety, I would have sold myself short. Mm -hmm. I would have sold myself short. My wish list would have been you know, a tiny little crumb compared to the cake that God wanted for me. I always looked at the world as a victim. 
-hmm. I really did. I looked at the world as, why did I get the short end of the stick? Oh. Why is life always unfair to me? Why am I, you know, singled out and get all of these problems? Why was I dealt a bad hand mm -hmm. when I was born? And my perspective and my point of view has completely shifted. You know, things don't happen to me, they happen for me. Mm -hmm. And really, I grew up, I have it so much better than probably 99% of the world. Like there's people that are really suffering and I and I know people that have had it way worse than me and I've traveled to other countries and I've been in different poor areas of the US, like real extreme yeah. poverty. And there's people that have happiness. Like happiness Some, is sometimes, not- Sometimes the poorest people yes, are the happiest. Exactly. Yeah. And, and so I totally yeah. shifted my perspective that, you know, life didn't serve me a bad hand and I don't have the short end of the stick. And I stopped being the victim. You know, I started taking responsibility for myself mm -hmm. and saying, no, I'm not a victim. I have control over the decisions I make and I'm gonna make positive decisions and take positive actions to change the way I feel, to get into a better position, to, you know, solve a problem that I'm dealing with. You know, there's a famous saying that somebody told me early in my recovery, they said, you can't think your way into better action, but you can act your way into better thinking. Mm. And sometimes you just gotta take like, you gotta have blind faith and just start doing the action even if you don't believe in it yeah. and even if it doesn't make sense to you. <laughs> and after a couple of That's weeks of just true. taking this like almost mechanical action, you'll start to feel better. Yeah. It's like waking up every day and just praying. Like no matter what you do, hit your knees, pray, do 10 minutes of meditation and like, you can act, that's an action that you're taking. Like you have to physically take that action. And over the weeks, like your mentality will start to change. But like me sitting and analyzing my problems <laughs> for weeks gonna... at a time is not gonna change yeah. my my yeah. my uh, situation. 100%. Yeah. Um, so I'd love to ask you how healing yourself um, or how this healing journey has basically changed or he helped heal your family. Like I said at the beginning, my parents divorced when I was three years old. And it was, you know, a very resentful divorce. They weren't, you know, uh, friends with each other, you know, for, for lack of a better word. They were, you know, angry with each other and they had resentment and judgment towards one another. Um, and, you know, I felt that growing up. I knew that my parents didn't like each other, mm. right? So I'm caught in the middle because I love both of them yeah. equally. And I, you know, felt also very unhappy and insecure about that, that my parents were divorced and other families had their, you yeah. know, a whole we're together, a nuclear family. So through my recovery process, when I finally had that radical spiritual awakening in 2009, and I went and made, you know, a heart to heart, honest, authentic amends to my dad, mm -hmm. honest, authentic amends to my mom. And they could start seeing that I'm not just sober now, but I'm really a different mm -hmm. version of Michael. This is not, the, you know, Michael just removed the drugs and alcohol. Like Michael now has a new spirit. Oof. It's not just a new, it's not just, you know, he's he's sober and safe. He has a new spirit all around. Mm. And that spirit is attractive, mm. right? This, uh, our spirits can attract or repel people. 100%. No matter, it's no matter what position they're in. And my family was now attracted to my spirit. Oh. And they could see my business was progressing so fast and I'm hiring 20 employees, 30 employees, 40 employees. I'm in Inc. Maggot. They're like, <laughs> man, Michael, like, how did this came out of nowhere? Now I'm more successful than my parents, right? My mom obviously was, um, you know, just a waitress in her whole life. Then she got a career in banking where she also, my mom has so much grit and so much resilience, you know? At 52 years old or 55 years old, she, changed her whole life. Hmm. And she said, you know what? She struggled with not having confidence and not having good self-esteem, you know, for whatever reasons. 
but she went out and applied at a banking job for Bank of America and just became a loan officer and taught herself out of nowhere. My mom's wow. never been to college. And she then climbed the corporate ladder because she's so good at sales, so good. She, whenever she does something, she just pours her heart into it. So she became banking center manager. <laughs> then she became VP of loan. And she like recreated her life in her 50s. It's inspiring. So yeah, so now she's 60 years old. She has a big career, you know, making over six figures from being a waitress. So she's super successful. And they could see all of my success. And I said, because she had this new banking you know, background now, and she helped me set up my bank accounts and she would do wire transfers for me because she's my banking representative <laughs> at Bank of America. And I said, mom, why don't you retire and come work with me? Wow. Yeah. So, so my business was, was successful enough where I could, you know, hire her. Amazing. She retired from Bank of America, came to work for me. And this is where the story gets crazy. My dad from Iran was a was an engineer. He had a, a, a electronical and computer engineering degree. I mean, Iran. Yeah, the, they're, the yeah, revolution. they're they known were, for engineers. Computer science. Yeah, and computer science amazing. and engineers. <laughs> so he migra He he came immigrated to the U.S. in the early '70s and went to KU and got an engineering computer engineering degree. And he had always worked as an engineer for different uh, tech companies, Motorola, Texas Instruments, Toshiba, Invensys, Triconics. So he had all these different computer engineering degrees that were just, you know, good, stable careers. But as my business is progressing, since he had that engineering background and he was in manufacturing and computer hardware, I convinced him to also join the company. <laughs> and these are my, oh, I, I wanna share another part because I, I kind of skipped ahead in the story. When I was at my rock bottom, like rock, rock, rock bottom with my heart infection, I mean, the doctors were very honest with my mom and dad. And my dad's in California. My mom's in Austin. Michael has a 50-50 chance of living, right? So they want to stay as close to me as possible because they might not mm -hmm. get me the next day. Mm -hmm. You know, I was on 50-50 life support from this heart infection, right? I'm on my deathbed, hooked up to IV antibiotics through a big line. My dad flies in from California, my mom's there. And that, my suffering and my near-death experience started to bring them back together. Mm -hmm. Because they, they it was so obvious to them, like whatever they were angry at themselves about or resentful or had previous, um, you know, judgment towards another, that meant nothing now. Like, that was not important to focus on. They want their son to be alive. They equally have the same common goal mm -hmm. of wanting their son to be alive and wanting to spend time with him before he dies. You know, they didn't know if I was going to live. So, like, that immediately started to remove some of the anger and resentment. And they would call each other to, like, brainstorm about me. how to help me or mm -hmm. serve me. So that the suffering started bringing them back together for obvious reasons. And they like would be cordial with each other because of my suffering. Then when I had my spiritual awakening and I had this new spirit that was very attractive to both of them, they all, they started, I don't know, it's like almost through osmosis, started modeling my behavior, huh. right? So they started seeing like, man, Michael has empathy for us and for people around him and for his employees. Michael is living a life that's dedicated to service. not having resentment oh. and service and not holding grudges and anger. Oh. And they started modeling that. Wow. That's beautiful. So then they started to reconnect and like, like make amends to each other. Through that's my that's amends amazing. process, they started making amends to one another and like getting rid of these 20 years of grudges that they had been bottled up wow. and been suffering from. Like resentment that's untreated is like a cancer in and oh, of yeah, itself. Of course. It'll like if you alive. bury your resentment, 
it's just going to cause you to feel physically sick, mentally sick. Okay. And then when you see the person, that sickness comes out. Yeah, yeah of course. I mean, our emotions cause yes. chronic illness. Oh, 100%. Yeah. So they made amends to each other and gave each other a second chance. Mm. So then my dad has this computer, computer engineering background. My mom is a banking background. And those are two positions I needed <laughs> at MHD. <laughs> and that was something early on that I identified is that I need to find specialized knowledge that can help my business be successful. Because I knew, I didn't even have a college degree. <laughs> Amazing. I knew that I need specialists in key areas because that's what the business needs to scale. So I convinced my dad to move from California to Austin and work for me. Now I have my mom and dad both working for me. <laughs> and I'm the successful one. It's like... You're a magician. It's like, no, it's like, Michael. seriously, it's like out of like the Twilight Zone or something, <laughs> like out of a movie. So I have my mom and dad working for me. So now my suffering is what started to bring them back together. But now my spiritual awakening and my new lease on life that God gave me was the final mold mm -hmm. and glue that held them together. I love it. So, so the suffering started it and then the spiritual awakening sealed it. So my dad's working for me. My mom's working for me. Then, I mean, the business is so skyrocketing, so busy. I hired my stepmom. <laughs> I'm not joking. So my Persian stepmom, my mom, and my dad all working for me. <laughs> so, so good. Yeah. yeah. So they're all, they all were showing up to the office together and having fun working together. And like, they even had to pinch themselves. They're like, for 20 years, we were mad at each other and like never talked. And we're worried about our son who is an IV heroin addict. And now we're working for him. <laughs> and they just like, it was just like a scene out of a so movie. So good. I so they have the closest relationship Aww. nowadays. My mom is best friends with my stepmom. My mom is great friends with my dad. We go on vacations together. <laughs> As like my stepmom, my mom, and my dad. <laughs> like then I had, so then I want to share, like from that journey, I started practicing the law of attraction and, and like manifestation. And I could see, like I said at the beginning, I was using that for negative things back when I was in middle school and high school. And I didn't even realize it. So I really started to analyze that. I'm like, man, I was doing this for the wrong reasons before, I'm going to start doing it for the right reasons. And I wrote out, you know, this letter to myself about like the woman of my dreams and who I want to marry. And then God sent me Ileana. <laughs> now, I'm not joking. Like I manifested Ileana into my life. And like, I met her for the first time. And I was like, that is the woman I want to marry. And literally, after, like she was dating somebody at the time, but I was like, this is the woman I want to marry. And I just kept that obsession in my head or this like <laughs> image of me marrying Ileana in my head. And it, like she matched the wish list that I had written, the letter I'd written out to myself, like my dream woman. And I just kept thinking about it and like saying I am statements to myself that I was marrying her and speed up a year and a half later, we started dating. Then I proposed her. It was like a, an affirmation from God that like, this is the woman, this is your soulmate. This is who you're meant to marry and have a family with. It was like all of these affirmative signs from the universe. Hmm. So we have our first son and we named him Michael because we had a deep connection to Michael the Archangel at that time. And she wanted also to, she loved the name Michael. And she wanted to name our first son, Michael, after, you know, after me. So Michael Lewis Tadashi. And then that that's now the third layer that's even just brought my family mm -hmm. even to the like max supreme closeness and in harmony with one another. Like my mom, my dad, my stepmom have literally the closest relationship in the world. And it just revolves around like my family and then their grandson. Their grandson is like number one most important thing in both of their lives and my stepmom's life. And also my my in-laws, Ileana's parents, I feel like are my second 
parents and second family. Mm-hmm. Like truly my my letter to myself of my dream woman, like again, I even sold myself short. Like what God had in store for me was better than, <laughs> than what my wish list was because I got the most amazing in-laws and like a second mom and dad that is like truly a gift from God because I'm so connected to both of them and to their family. And it was just like, I couldn't even, again, wish this because God had a greater gift for me than I could even realize. Beautiful. Um, So much of your healing journey includes a lot of people helping you um, and you helping other people. Mm -hmm. What's the connection between relationships and healing? I feel like something that people don't talk about is the relationship with yourself. Mm. I feel like you have to form, or at least I can only speak for myself, I had to form a relationship with myself and have a connection with my own spirit and feel good in myself before I could have an authentic relationship with somebody else. Beautiful. And I would always go about it the opposite way. Like I would never care about having a relationship with myself. I always just wanted to have a relationship with my friends or coworkers or whatever. But having the relationship with myself and trusting myself and feeling good about myself and spending time meditating and connecting to my own inner self, that was the number one relationship that then had a ripple effect on all my other relationships. But I think it's essential to have relationships because I believe our spirit is like water. Mm -hmm. And what happens to water if it's in a pool with no movement? Mm -hmm. It goes stagnant. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's what happens to our spirit. So if our spirit isn't flowing and has like, you know, a, a river connected to that pond, the water's gonna go stagnant mm. and grow disease. So I believe that our our spirit is like water. We have to connect with others and let our spirit flow to others and be of service to others and allow other people to be of service to us so the water can flow and stay healthy and full of vitality. Oh, I love that analogy. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Can you tell us what Infinite Recovery is and describe your journey with this organization? Yes. So, like I said, I changed my relationship with business and I changed my perspective on the definition of business. And I was hiring all people that were graduates from recovery centers and living in sober living homes. I formed this now, like I had mentioned before, additional perspective that business and entrepreneurship can be a vehicle to change other people's lives and make a positive ripple effect on other people's lives and give other people purpose. So what ended up shifting in MHD was the thing that was feeding my spirit the most was actually the people I was hiring. It wasn't the computer parts. Yeah, of course. The computer (laughs) parts were just a widget, so to speak, that gave us all, you know, work to be connected to one another and have this community. It wasn't about the computer parts. Mm -hmm. It was really about the community and my employees. So as I was hiring people, there was a, I, I, again, I would have relationships with all of my staff and I was hiring people and people would always complain, I don't have a place to live. Like, where can I go rent an apartment? Nobody will lease to me because I have bad credit or I have a felony. You know, it's very hard for people that are, that are in recovery to get an apartment or yeah. to get, you know, qualified for for a, a car or, or, a, or an apartment. So I said, man, there's this huge void in Austin. I need to build a sober living community. Like whenever I see a problem, I look at it through a business lens. I'm like, how can I solve this problem through business? That's my new perspective on business. So I bought a, a rental home. You know, I, I, I was actually, I didn't even own my own home. I was leasing a home and I had bought another home to turn it into a sober living home before I even bought my own home. So I bought this home. And I, you know, got people in recovery, got my staff 
to like remodel it and make it like appropriate for sober living. Like you've got to add extra rooms and like ch we changed the dining room into a bedroom. Like we outfitted it to be a perfect sober home. And I started my first sober home. So now I had the sober home and I'm renting beds to people that need sober living post residential treatment. And then I was like, man, I gotta have like, I can't have this mixed with my MHD business because it's not the same business. So I just formed a new LLC. <laughs> and actually, you know, it's funny. I, I had the LLC dormant for years before infinite recovery. It's like wow. almost like I like manifested yeah. infinite recovery. So I formed this LLC called infinite recovery two years before we started infinite recovery. Oh, chills. Because I was using the name, I love the name infinite because infinite means God to me. Mm. Like infinite is God, right? That's like the simplest definition of a higher power. Like the universe. Yeah, yeah, the universe is infinite, right? So I used the word infinite and then recovery because I was gonna recover computer parts. Huh. I was gonna recover uh, asset management. So I started this LLC called Infinite Recovery because it was gonna be an offshoot of MHD where I went to companies like Dell, HP, Apple, Sony, and I would recover all of their e-waste. <laughs> so I called it infinite recovery. Like we recover your e-waste, we recycle it and refurbish it and resell it, infinite recovery. But I had never like started that offshoot. So it was like lying dormant. Then I started my sober living and I'm going through my list of like LLCs that I own. I'm like, oh my God, this also <laughs> applies to infinite recovery. Like we're giving people sobriety or housing for their sobriety and their recovery. For infinite recovery. And, for it, and we're trying to give them infinite recovery. <laughs> so I used that LLC that was sitting dormant for years into infinite recovery. Oh. And that was right at the same time that I was dating Ileana. Ileana has a deep connection to giving back as well. Mm -hmm. She's not in recovery and has never been exposed to alcoholism or addiction before meeting me and had no knowledge about addiction or recovery. But she was like, man, the work that, that you're doing, like volunteer work, because she knew that I would go every Sunday and go volunteer at Austin Recovery. She was like, it's so admirable. And like, I wish I could participate. And oh, like, wow. she just has a deep, like, like passion and connection to helping people. And that's what she did while she was Miss Texas. She was Miss Texas 2015. And she would set up, you know, toy drives for kids that are in the colonias in her hometown of McAllen. It's like this shadow community of immigrants that don't have access to water. They don't mm -hmm. have access to electricity. And she would set up like toy drives for them during Christmas. Like she's always been involved in altruism and service. So she saw that like I had gotten this recovery home and that we had this uh, LLC dormant infinite recovery. And she's like, Michael, like I wanna help you and like be a part of infinite recovery. Mm -hmm. So like that's how we officially launched infinite recovery. And we got a second sober home for women. Now we had a men's sober home and a women's sober home. Then I saw the need because the people that were in sober living were like, man, after I get out of inpatient rehab. Where do I go? Yeah, how do I continue counseling? How do I continue aftercare? There was no really good aftercare programs or outpatient programs in Austin. Mm. And again, I saw the void and I look <laughs> at things like, where do people need services? And that's the business that I wanna build around it. Mm. So Ileana and I were like, yeah, let's start a clinical center. So we started a clinical center that was intensive outpatient that people that were living in our sober living homes or other sober living homes could go for aftercare post-residential treatment. Mm -hmm. And we interviewed clinicians and you know therapists and started hiring therapists. And again, what made me so passionate and what made me so excited to get up in the morning for MHD was the people I was hiring. It wasn't the computer parts. Mm -hmm. Like the computer parts were just a byproduct of mm -hmm. what the business was doing. So now Infinite Recovery is totally dedicated towards housing for people in recovery, giving them clinical services, giving them, you know, a shot at really good, solid recovery and stability. And that just like totally pulled my focus and, and also Ileana's focus, 
like, hey, let's go all into Infinite and really make a huge ripple effect in Austin. And then hopefully that ripple effect spreads to Texas and just can continue spreading through the US. So my dad had the computer engineering degree and I said, you know what, dad? I'm going to let you run MHD now. <laughs> and I made him the CEO. Amazing. And I moved into a board position. And we started scaling infinite. And I want to, I'll speed up, you know, seven years later. Ileana and I ended up buying Austin Recovery. Yeah. Oh my God, I got goosebumps. They were, they were going it's out fine. of business. The, the recovery center that gave me the grant to get treatment for the first time and then a grant the second time in 06 and 07. They were having, because they're a nonprofit, COVID really wiped out their funding sources and allocation of resources were going more towards hospitals mm -hmm. for COVID instead of recovery centers. And they lost their support. And I don't know the exact reasons, but they were putting their ranch up for sale. The exact ranch that I was wow. a patient at. <sighs> It's a 40 acre ranch in South Austin, gorgeous, so serene center that had a hundred beds of inpatient beds. And it was, it was where I went to treatment. Mm -hmm. And when I found that art, I'm like, oh my God, we have to buy this center. And Ileana was like, that, that's the center that like gave you the second chance on life. Like, let's pray to God that we can have this opportunity. Wow. And everybody knows like what was happening in 2020, 20, there was like this real estate boom. Mm -hmm. So there were developers that wanted that ranch to build homes on. They wanted to turn oh, it yeah, into a subdivision. Course. But the board and the donor said it has to be a recovery center. So other recovery centers were interviewing to buy it. It was like a very prized mm -hmm. uh, ranch to buy because it was outfitted perfectly as, a, as an inpatient recovery center. But I went and interviewed with the board. I had this deep connection to them because I had been giving them so many scholarships that they awarded me, wow. Ileana and I, an infant recovery, That's the amazing. ranch. And we we closed on it. Obviously, um, you know, it was a big undertaking financially for us, but it's just such an amazing, you know, gift from God. The recovery center that I went to on a scholarship, God gave us the opportunity to purchase and continue the uh, the journey of infinite recovery. So Ileana had this amazing idea. She said, Michael, because you went there and because of the work and the impact that Austin Recovery has made, now that infinite recovery owns the ranch, let's call it Legacy Ranch hmm. to keep the legacy going. Aww. Beautiful. Now that you own and run Infinite Recovery mm -hmm. and now Legacy Ranch too, yes. how do you handle questions around making care financially accessible? Because obviously not everybody can afford yeah. to, go to, to go to rehab. That is a great question. And that's another void and, and need that I found through this process of owning my sober living homes and owning our outpatient clinic was recovery was so unaffordable and so expensive. And the waiting list for a place like Inf uh, Austin Recovery was so long. Mm -hmm. Like the waiting list just kept growing. Addiction is growing every year. Yeah. It's not going down. So one of the main focuses, again, I saw a need and a void. And that's what I formed the business around was there was no in-network solutions mm. for people seeking recovery. There's a ton of out of network and cash pay because the companies made more money. You know, they could charge exorbitant fees to the insurance companies all out of network or char charge private pay. So Ileana and I made it our focus. We're going to make infinite recovery an in-network facility to where people can apply their in-network benefits to get the full scope of recovery. Mm -hmm. And we built out the full continuum of care. And that was a huge financial undertaking for us at investment on the front end to build out detox, inpatient, PHP, IOP, OP, sober living. We built out this whole vertically integrated recovery ecosystem that was all in network. So people that had insurance, which I mean, just in this country, and it's so sad that this is the fact, but like, it's hard to live, to have a life without health insurance. Like, 
it's just so difficult to have any of your dental needs or just, you know, physical checkups or if you, you know, you have a, a child, like you have to have health insurance. Mm -hmm. And I couldn't imagine people that, again, that's a huge undertaking just for a family to have health insurance, to not be able to apply their health insurance to, you know, something that's so critical and life-saving. So we made it our mission to go in network and we, again, you make less, you get less money from an in-network contract, but you're passing that benefit onto the family and onto the client. And then we built out the vertically integrated system so that people could get four or five months of treatment wow. under just their $3,000 deductible. Wow. Like if you pay your deductible, now you're met for all the other services and places would outsource all those services and we brought them in house so that you could get a solid like like actual solution to your addiction remember what i said earlier that like austin recovery tried their hardest but like they never got to the root of the problem mm. and that's something that most recovery centers don't do and it's not because they have bad intentions but they're not set up for that full continuum of care mm. and they're not set up to really tackle the addiction at its root. And that's what we do at Infinite Recovery. Amazing. Like we tackle it at the root and we make sure you go through the full life cycle of a four month step down process where you're slowly integrated back into society and you're supported clinically and through your peers to have a stable foundation post inpatient. Wow, that's amazing. And how about people without insurance? So we give so many grants. We have a, a scholarship program that about 10% of our beds at all times get donated. Amazing. And I do that just because of the gift that I got. Yeah, of course. And just like I shared, like we did that with so many of Austin Recovery's recipients. And now that Austin Recovery is gone, we still just continue that legacy Amazing. by, you know, people call our admissions line. And if we have our scholarship beds open, like we'll go through, you know, a process of, of interviewing them and, and giving them a second chance and an opportunity at that bed. Awesome. It's amazing the impact that you're doing. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, you and your wife have started a family. Yes. When you were deep in your addiction, did you ever think you could get here? And how has fatherhood affected the way you see your story? Oh my God, I never in a million years even imagined that I would have the gift of marriage, let alone fatherhood. Like it has been the greatest gift. Recovery and my marriage and fatherhood are like the greatest gift that God has given me. And fatherhood has totally changed my perspective on life and just my sense of purpose. Now I have an additional sense of purpose in life that not only am I, you know, serving God, but God's will for me is to be a role model mm -hmm. and be a caretaker for my son and provide for my wife and be, you know, a solid partner for my wife. And, and just, it's totally just changed my perspective on, on what uh, I value in life. And, you know, seeing my son and the relationship that we have together, that's like something that drugs and alcohol could <laughs> never give me. Like that euphoria and sense of well-being is something that is like a hundred times greater than any drug I've ever done. So beautiful. <laughs> what advice would you give to other families whose loved ones are going through addiction? I would say, I mean, the number one advice I would give would, would be to get to the root of the problem. Mm -hmm. I know that's been a common theme, but really like addiction is so chronic and so cunning, baffling, and powerful that if you don't address it head on and get to the root of the problem, you may not get a second chance. Like people are dying every day. And if somebody is showing signs of addiction and like it's pretty crystal clear that they have, you know, they're in the grips of addiction or alcoholism, 
address it head on. Do not enable the problem. Do not, you know, try to put band-aids on it, like changing people, places, and things, or just going to, uh, you know, outpatient family therapy. Like if you truly have addiction and the, the family and the person has identified they have addiction, they need inpatient treatment. They need something that's going to really address the root of their problem and remove the cancer mm. from their body. Mm. So that would be the advice is be radically honest with yourself and with your loved one that this is serious and you need to treat this just like cancer and treat it head on and throw all of your energy and, and focus into addressing that. Yeah, that's powerful, it's true. Yeah. Um, there's a trans your children I'm going to say children. Yes. <laughs> yes. We'll watch this uh, in the future. Yes. What would you like to say to them? Oh, man. You know, <laughs> something that, that, that I've talked with Ileana about is I want to teach my children. This is something I would want to say for them to see. You don't need to go through the suffering to force an awakening. Like, focus on that first and focus on your spirituality and forming a spiritual fitness early on and a spiritual, you know, identity early on. And that will be the number one focus of your life. And everything else will be a byproduct of that. Mm -hmm. You know, society really, this is the way I've always interpreted society. Um, have your physical health, right? Have be, be, be the sexiest person, have your physical looks, make a lot of money, and then you're going to be, uh, you know, that's the number one most important thing is, right, your outside appearance. If, you have, if you're a millionaire, have a nice house, have, a, have a, an amazing car and have success and you look good, that's the number one. That's the, like, the holy grail. That's the number one most important thing. That's what we're sold. That's what we're sold. Then probably number two is have all of the accolades have the Harvard degree, have this, it's right, it's your your mental success. Then three is have your, you know, emotional success, be, be able to uh, talk to people and have relationships. And then last, when you're finally, you know, retired in your 60s, form a charity, form a, a 501c3 and give back when you're retired and form your spiritual success. And really, you wanna flip that. Mm. It's actually backwards. Start with your spiritual success first and let that dictate, you know, the other uh, things, because that's the number one most important thing. And that's what I want, the message that I would love to give my children. Mm. Beautiful. How would you teach them that? I believe, uh, I believe the greatest way to teach them that is through action, you know, through doing it with them and through being a good, you know, mirror of that and through action. I think that's the that's the greatest way I've learned is I would model what my sponsor share, shared with me or people that I admired or different business lead. That's all, how I've always learned is through watching people's action and just learning from the experience. Yeah. It's very experiential. Um, is there any other parting thoughts you'd like to share before we wrap? Yes, um, the attitude of gratitude. And really have that be like in your DNA or in my DNA as my attitude and my outlook on life. Mm. Like I said before, I used to believe that I got the short end of the stick or I was built it, dealt a bad hand. And that is totally false. It's all my perspective mm. of life. And that is something I would also love to teach my children is always have a gratitude list. Always be in a, a position and attitude of gratitude because that will change your perspective on any situation. You know, no matter what you're going through, there are so many things, probably more than you could even write on a page that you should be, there you could be grateful for. Yeah. And you have such a, so much blessing and gratitude more than 99% of the world. And, and, and just to realize that and honor that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I say alhamdulillah yeah, all the time. Yeah, and that's, <laughs> we spoke about that. Yes. It's, it's, it's a reminder for our subconscious. Totally. You know, because we can so easily drift away from that. Yeah. And we don't even know it, yeah. you know. And then we're in a position of, 
anger or fear. And it's like, hey, alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. We, need, we need to be grateful. So grateful. Yes. So grateful. And let's get back to, to get, get, get back in gear. Yeah. Yeah. Get recalibrated <laughs> with gratitude. Totally. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Yes. I so of appreciate course. you. <laughs> of course. Thank you, Vera. If you enjoyed this conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. You can connect with Into Healing on TikTok and Instagram for more inspirational and behind-the-scenes content, and visit our website, intohealing.com, for transcripts and other goodies. Into Healing is made possible thanks to people like you. Contributions made through Venmo at Into Healing or through our website, intohealing.com, help us bring you more inspiring episodes. This has been Into Healing with Mira Adura. Thank you for joining us.